How's it going folks? Stu here. Listen, it's been a couple of months since I last done one of these. That's because this time every year things just get insanely busy. October is apparently the month where all of my plans just happen. Also film festival, which is a lot of time to take up. As such, I didn't get a September last month on Letterboxd out for you guys when I needed to get one out. Which means this time, listen, it may have been a while since we caught up, but good things come to those who wait, eh? Because it's yet another mammoth edition today, my guys, because we're not talking about just one. We're not talking about just two. We are talking about just two. Two months in one. Grab yourself a beverage and kick back with me as we go through everything I watched in September and October. And it's cozy season now, so get yourself something cozy. Hot chocolate, whiskey. Hot chocolate and whiskey. Listen, September slash October. Those are some months, huh? Weren't they? September, I'm gonna say it, pretty fine month for film watching, you know, pretty normal stuff. October, that stuff is rammed. So I'm gonna have to apologize first and foremost for how many things I logged on Letterboxd. I guess that's the, a good thing, the point of these videos maybe. But you know, as I said, the London Film Festival happened is a thing that occurs in October every year, which means that my Letterboxd diary just sort of gets stuffed to the brim uh, and it wants to burst and it's just sort of screaming, help me, help me, let me out, someone help me. But listen, now's about the time that I tell you if you're not already following me on Letterboxd, go ahead and follow me there. So links are down in the description for that so you can make sure you're seeing anything I'm logging when I'm logging them. I will give you fair warning at the moment though, because the film festival is such a saturated time for movie watching, November's always just a drought. Should we jump into it? I think we really well should. September, ladies and gentlemen. Round of applause everyone for September. September feels to me a lot like it happened many decades ago, but it wasn't. It was just a few months because time, man. I just can't do it. Start things off on the 9th. I didn't watch a film for nine days at the beginning of September. That might be an error, um, but we're going to go with it. I start things off with Thor Love and Thunder, which is, of course, the latest Thor film. Those of you that have been following me for a while now that have seen a bunch of these last month on Letterboxd will know that, listen, me and Marvel, we haven't been really clicking this phase four. Nothing's... It's been shit, let's be honest. But I do love Taika Waititi. I didn't see this in the cinema. I had no real interest to. Came up on Disney+, Plus. thought I'd catch up on it. If it had been a bit less completely obviously made up as it went along, might have actually landed its emotional beats. But ultimately, entertaining enough. Also, too much Guns N' Roses, Jesus Christ. I am just happy to watch Taika Waititi do whatever the hell he wants, really, at the end of the day. So that's why this one was fun enough for me and I was entertained by it and it didn't get a negative score. But yeah, very obviously didn't have a plan. And also, just like, I don't know, we only listened to Guns N' Roses CDs at the time or something. Three stars for Thor Love and Thunder. But next up on the 11th, I watched The Terrorizers, which is an Edward Yang film. This was one I was watching because I wanted to catch up on some bits as I was doing some content for Mubi. Said content is over on my Instagram, link down there in the description for that. Bit of a self bump. A, I love Edward Yang, and B, I was trying to find films that felt like good Sunday watches. This was definitely a good Sunday watch. Man, I... Edward Yang, he really is one of the best filmmakers of all time, isn't he? So, so good. Already can't wait to rewatch it down the line. I love Edward Yang. That's a very concise letterbox review. Don't need to add much to it at all. Edward Yang, if you've not seen an Edward Yang film, watch an Edward Yang film, man. This is a good one to start with, I guess. They're hard to really talk about and explain without, just, just watch it, you'll enjoy it. Like, if you don't enjoy this film, you suck. Then I watched Mulholland Drive, a uh, nice, fun, easy watch. This was, I remember, I think the week before I went on holiday. I think it might've even been the night before I was like, off to Mallorca to chill for a week and a bit. So obviously my thinking was, look, if I'm gonna let myself chill for a week and a bit, I need to, I don't know, go through immense trauma in my brain for a night. Every single sequence of this thing is astonishing. Yep, couldn't have put it better myself. <laughs> Hang on, it, I did. David Lynch is obviously a filmmaker that, I, you know, he's acclaimed, of course, but if you don't like David Lynch, you don't like David Lynch. <laughs> the beauty of it is Lynch's direction and the way he just sort of throws you as a viewer through this story. God, just, it so perfectly pieces itself together for you as well. What a film. Absolute dream of a film. Five stars for Mulholland Drive, naturally. Then I watched Do Revenge, which is one which kind of looked... F I didn't have much expectations. It just popped up and I thought, that looks fun. And I love Maya Hawk, So I gave it a watch. At first, I thought the whole Heather thing would have been this film's biggest hurdle. But honestly, it ended up just being fun as heck. And also, Maya Hawk is fucking rad as shit. Yeah, looks very Heathers-y. And I'd heard people like, this is like a Gen Z Heathers or whatever. Which, if I'm honest, sounds pants. But I was glad to see it was a film which is absolutely having fun with itself. Has an absolutely batshit Sophie Turner sort of cameo in there as well, which is always fun. Fun to watch people do bad things 
can be terrible people in films sometimes, you know? That's why Heathers was great. Uh, uh, you know, it's not as good as Heathers. But yeah, Maya Hawke, man, she just... She rocks. Three and a half stars for Do Revenge. And then we come on to the beginning of my London Film Festival screening. So, um, yeah, listen, guys, buckle in, because it, it is about to get stormy. And they started with Holy Spider, which is one which I don't have a review out for on the channel yet, but which I will be having a full review out on the channel soon. Be honest, this didn't end up managing to wow me despite a lot of promise and interesting reflections. Feels like a film of two halves, spends too long in the first to fully land the themes of the second. Definitely a lot of great stuff in there and a lot of good stuff to unpack and I can understand why a lot of people really love this thing. But it didn't really wow me as much as I was just sort of impressed with seeing a different take like this, if that makes much sense. Sort of fine start to the festival watches for me. Three stars for Holy Spider. It was a triple bill day to kick things off for me as well, because I then followed it up with Liquor Store Dreams, which is, again, a film I'll be getting thoughts out on the channel later on down the line. But for now, it was just a lovely little documentary. I didn't have huge expectations. Frankly, didn't know anything about this one. A sincere look at family dynamics and cultural generational clashes with a genuinely engaging scrapbooky feel. Yeah, it's just a really charming documentary. That kind, you know, when you watch a documentary that's made by someone that just wants to tell this thing. Well, I guess it sounds stupid because all documentaries are that. Some Otherwise, why would people make documentaries? But there's something really endearing, I think, about a family member documenting stuff about their family and just trying to peel back layers of what they're going through. It feels very personal in that sense, which I think is what made it so endearing as a documentary overall. Three and a half stars for Liquor Store Dreams. Then I watched Brother. Again, I don't, this is going to sound really repetitive, but I feel like I do need to say it. Uh, do I? I'm going to do it every time anyway. This is going to be talked about on a channel eventually, so we'll keep it brief. <laughs> Aesthetically, thought this thing was pretty great, and on paper, the split timelines act as an interesting way through memory and collective trauma, but it rarely comes together as effectively as it thinks it does. Yeah, it's a really weird thing to describe when you're watching a film, and you kind of, you feel like you should be really, really loving this thing. Everything is lining up for you on paper, but something just isn't clicking. That is exactly what I have with this film. Three stars for Brother. And we kick things off the next week with another London Film Festival screening in the form of Mia Hansen Love's new one, One Fine Morning, which I have a full review for. So again, brief thoughts, link down there for the full one. Another genuinely lovely watch manages not to falter under its undeniably familiar dramatic beats thanks to a brilliant laser do and Hansen Love's typically authentic and sincere perspective. Yeah, I've seen a lot of people just sort of say this is just kind of generic French drama 101. And I don't like wholly disagree with that, but why is that such a bad thing when it's coming from someone like Mia Hansen Love? I'm genuinely asking. Big fan of this one. Four stars for one fine morning. And then next up in that week, I saw Emily the Criminal. Again, full review for this one on the channel. Link down there for that if you want to watch me say some more words about this. I guess any Aubrey Plaza film that I don't immediately love counts as a disappointment, but this is at least still anchored by a genuinely great central performance. Thank you for coming to this TED Talk. Three stars. And then I finished the month off with Causeway, which is a new Jennifer Lawrence movie. Well, she's in it. She didn't... She didn't make, you know what I mean. And guess what, my guys? You aren't going to believe this, but I got a whole review for it on the channel. I know, unbelievable. So good to see Lawrence killing it again in a quieter role, supported by a great Brian Tyree Henry. Love the focus on suggestion over telling, but I wish this had a little more consistency. Yeah, it's annoying when you see someone that's doing such great work in suggesting things to then keep falling back to just telling us how to feel and it's that feeling of just swinging back into convention when you were doing such a good job of sort of avoiding all that stuff three stars for causeway and here we go folks september's done it's time for october you want to have a little peek of that look at this i have to i have to actually scroll like three times my magic mouse here these little muscles doing wonders for me right now. 3rd of October, the first film of the month for me was The Banshees of Inner Sharon. The film festival hadn't started good and proper just yet. This was a few days before it. So, you know, still ticking off that pre-festival screening list. But yeah, this was a banger. I really, really enjoyed this. I've loved Martin McDonald's other works. He's great. And as I've said here, he doesn't miss. Simple review. We'll leave it at that because guess what? Full review is on the channel. Link down there. Jesus Christ. Four stars for The Banshees of Inner Sharon. Bonus point, donkey's cute as heck in this film and I will fight anyone that doesn't agree with me. Next film wasn't a film festival review. What a shocker. Uh, again, just before the film festival started, I got invited to another press screening for something entirely different and that different thing was weird, the Al Yankovic story. And goodness gracious guys, this film was an absolute bloody riot. Again, full review <clears throat> on the channel link down there in the description for that. We'll get past that nice and quickly. Uh, Daniel Radcliffe in this film, huh? What a guy. Honest to God, some of the most laughs I've had in a cinema for years. I have to say, though, what are you doing distributing this film? Huh? Roku? What the fuck is a Roku? 
Uh huh. Right, this film just came out last week over here, I think, or a few weeks back over in the UK. And I was like, oh, I'm excited to watch that again. I know it's free, it's on Roku. Um, I have many, many devices in this flat. I must be able to watch this film somehow, right? Wrong. Can't watch it. I can't watch it. I have no way of watching this film. Thank you. Make this film, like, I will pay for this film. Just make this film payable for. Let me rent this film, please. I'm begging you. Four stars for Weird, the Al Yankovic story. Tell you what else is weird. Putting Tilda in your film twice. Playing off each other. Crazy. I'm, of course, talking about The Eternal Daughter, which I saw on the 5th. This feels wrong because I know this wasn't the first film I watched at the festival. Hmm, what's going on here? Something spooky going on there. We'll move on from it, but seems that because this is a very creepy, eerie film from Joanna Hogg. And again, I've done a full review for it on the channel. No surprises, Double Swinton delivered the goods, but Hogg's haunted house tale is beguiling and atmospheric to no end, if a little meandering in places. But, you know, I, at this point I watched Joanna Hogg and whatever she wants to make. And I think Joanna Hogg's approach to this kind of atmospheric, eerie, it's not a horror, but I, I, I guess it has supernatural horror elements in there. It's a drama, really. I really enjoyed it. I think there's a lot to get from it. But yeah, a little bit too meandering, a little bit too long to really kind of blow me away. But my girl Tilda's in it twice. Three and a half stars for the Eternal Daughter. But I'll tell you what else is Eternal. Um, the... I've got nothing. The next one we'll watch is Corsage. I don't have a review for this one on the channel. Hmm, bit of an outlier there. But I do think I will get some thoughts on the channel out. So, you know, is this one another pair of pants? Because we'll keep it brief. Crips crushes it with a stupidly compelling turn as a restless empress. And aesthetically, this thing kills. But I did want a bit more of its only fleeting subversive moments. I was kind of led to believe that this thing was like a big kind of, I don't know, rebellious kind of middle finger fuck you. And it definitely is that. But I just think that... I wanted more of that. Like, I think it could have really done a lot more with that. Like, go for that shit. I'm here for it. Three and a half stars. Next up, here we go. I've worked it out. I logged this one later because it was a world premiere. That's why this is actually the first one I watched at the festival. I'm just saying it third because of the way I logged it. Roald Dahl's Matilda the Musical. Listen, full review on the channel. Goodness gracious. Link down there if you want to see my full thoughts. But for now, love the stage play. This one definitely feels like a worthy adaptation. Just delightful stuff. Could I have sounded more British? Probably not. Three and a half stars for Matilda the Musical. And the musical theme doesn't carry on because the next one I saw isn't a musical. It was White Noise. I haven't done a full review for this one. And I'm not sure I... I'll get one up, I'm sure. <laughs> Seems to be quite divisive, this one, but I found myself weirdly quite endeared to the kind of chaoticness, the franticness of this whole thing. There's a lot going on here. It's a very busy, busy film, but one which I think has a lot of merit. But Driver's killer performance, energetic sequences, and a genuinely amazing score from Elfman keep things feeling fresh enough to float. Yeah, Adam Driver, man, he's honestly like a get-out-of-jail-free card for most films at this point. I love the guy, and he kills it here. He's so good. He's so watchable. Three and a half stars for White Noise. Then I watched The Origin, which is a kind of caveman horror film. It sounds interesting, right? I knew nothing about it other than that. So I was obviously very kind of interested to see how this one would go. And I'll be honest, it kind of was good and bad in equal merit, I suppose. Ends up finding fairly solid footing, but spends a little too long doing the same repetitive scare sequences. You're in darkness, people leave the group, and then you hear some noises. I don't know, it's tense and it looks really good, but it wasn't hugely scary when I think it thought it was being a lot more scary. But I do like where this film ended up going and there's some really good moments in here. For me, just kind of fine. Three stars for the origin. And later that evening I saw The Estate, which is a new Anna Faris, Tony Collette comedy. So obviously I was excited and interested to see this one. Ended up not being very good. This film did play well with the audience. I'll give it credit there, but I don't know. Not funny. The intro to this one called it a rare unapologetic comedy, which does make its lazy, smug screenplay and lack of many actual laughs all the more ironic. Don't call your film a rare unapologetic comedy that's like hard to find nowadays and then your film not be that funny. Don't do that. Not a good thing. Two and a half stars for the estate. Then I watched Bones and All. Again, full review on the channel, but this was probably one of the most anticipated films at the festival for me and of the year for me because I love Luca Guadagnino's work. And this is him collaborating with Timmy Chalamet again, but in the context of a cannibal romantic film. I mean, how does this not sound just delightful? Delightful, maybe not the best. No, you know what? Delightful was the right word. How could this not sound delightful? Turns out, absolutely slapped. An immaculate balancing act of romance, coming of age, and cannibal horror, Guadagnino has crafted another textured, beautiful piece with stunning performances from Chalamet and Russell, woven together with another belter Reznor-Ross score. I've said it before, I will say it again, Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross, 
You may be magicians. Four and a half stars. I believe that is the first genuine sort of banger, holy shit, wow film of the festival for me. So light round of applause before moving on to the next one because we haven't got all day. Before we get to the next one, listen, got to address this. You'll notice having looked at this and also just because film festivals are film festivals, we're getting in multiple films a day here, right? We're looking at three on average each day and films are quite varied from film festivals. So you often find big fluctuating things. It's kind of rare, I don't know, that you go from like banger to banger to banger. Uh, and But that's what's happened here on this day because I went from Bones and All to Godland, which again, I have a full review for on the channel. But my goodness, this is the best looking film I've seen this year. It's stunning. Absolutely stunning film. Not since last year's Memoria have I seen such a fine-tuned slow burn of a film, gruelingly paced but stupidly absorbing. I haven't seen a better looking film this year. You know those films that come along and you just think, how have you made a film look this good for this long? Every shot of this film, stupid. Stupid. Four and a half stars for Godland. Then I watched The Wonder, which is now in cinemas, about to come out on Netflix. I haven't done a full review for yet, but we'll probably do one, so we'll keep it brief again. Killer Lord Cassidy is mental good. Tom Burke is underused to heck. Florence Pugh can do no wrong. You know it's a good, concise, stew letterbox review when the semicolons come up, huh? Mm. Three and a half stars for The Wonder. Then on the 8th of October, I watched what is absolutely my most anticipated film of the year. I had heard only good things about this film everywhere it had been showing. And so, yeah, my expectations and my hype were just kind of... Hadn't seen anything about it. And I will say, actually, I want to address this, right? I've been so good this year with not watching trailers. I just want to, like, I want to pat myself on the back there. Uh, if you guys could pat my back for me, that'd be great. For the film festival, I hadn't seen a trailer for a single one of these films, which was nice. Good to go into films blind. None more so, though, than Charlotte Wells' After Sun, which is a completely miraculous piece of cinema my god again i got a full review for this one on the channel please do go and check that out i, I want you to watch my thoughts if there's one review you watch for any of the films i've talked about here today make sure it's that one go watch that one hard to believe that this is charlotte wells first feature as she delivers the sort of stunning work more established directors have spent whole careers chasing and this was the first immediate full five stars of the festival for me you know it's good when a film comes along and does that, but I just, it was immediate. I knew it. It was a five stars. After that, I caught Unicorn Wars. You might be thinking, Stu, what the hell is Unicorn Wars? Um, to which I say that is exactly how we were all thinking before we saw Unicorn Wars. The only reason I saw this film was because I saw a still from it in the festival sort of program, and it was compared to sort of <laughs> Apocalypse Now with Care Bears. I'm obviously going to watch your film. It was crazy. Within the first five minutes, you see a Care Bear Willy. Mental film. Three stars. But talk about Whiplash going from Unicorn Wars to Women Talking. This was such a good film. I could say that. I should only say that. Listen, there's a lot of other people that have spoken about this film much more eloquently and better than I have. So please do seek out some actual good thoughts on this film from women that have experienced things and, and have that perspective. It's worthwhile. But I will say that this film really did pack a big punch and I think it kind of embraces the theatricality of just having these women talking in this space. Four stars for women talking. Every year the festival just sort of, there's a point where I'm like, I need to pause my brain for a little bit because I'm watching a lot of films. Weirdly, I find that my go-to is sort of slashes when I want to shut my brain off. And that's not, you know, a detriment to slashes. I love slashes. It's not a bad thing. It's good to want to shut your brain off for certain things, I think. But I'd never seen Halloween H2O, so I watched Halloween H2O. It delivered so fantastically 90s. Obnoxiously 90s, which is exactly what I wanted from this film. I will say that it kind of doesn't really feel like there's a lot to it. Like, it is pretty much just one location and like a few kills around there it doesn't feel like there's enough to it to warrant the runtime almost three stars for halloween h2o then i watched the sun which i have a review for on the channel you can go and watch but don't bother watching anything about this film this film sucks. An endurance test in lazy, messy storytelling, all the more infuriating given Zella's creative and insightful previous effort. Yeah, talk about, this is no bad film. I, I, I can't even, bad film. One and a half stars. You know how I was talking about that whiplash thing? Got it again, because we went from the sun down here to decision to leave. Absolutely sublime direction, absolutely sublime editing, absolutely sublime Tang Wei. Guys, seriously, I, I think I'm in love with her. Such a romantic and fun turn 
from Park Chan Wook, which I guess kind of makes sense with the trajectory his career's been going on, but was still a really welcome surprise. Four and a half stars for Decision to Leave which is an ironic title because I didn't ever want to leave this film. And then I finished that day off with St. Omer. And I've got to be honest, I sort of feel like this film wasn't helped by the fact that I watched it when I watched it. Sometimes you've got to be honest with yourself and admit that you're just feeling a little bit tired. And I really strongly do feel like there's a lot of great stuff in here that I might have connected with and engaged with a bit more had I been more alert. So I've got to put my hands up there and be transparent with you guys on this one. Love the patient restrained approach, which was just engaging enough to work. And Kagami and Malanga give great performances, but it didn't fully come together for me. I often actually tend to love slow cinema, so I'm surprised that I didn't really connect this one as much as I've seen other people connect with. Three stars for St. Omer. Then I watched another one of my more anticipated films, uh, in the form of Darren Aronofsky's The Whale, which again, I've got a full review for, so link down in the description for that. You heard a lot of things at this point, I'm sure, about Brendan Fraser's performance, and it is so, he's so good in this film. He, we need to give the man the Oscar now. Like, there's no point having an Oscar race for best actor. Good God, Brendan Fraser delivers and then some, but let's not overlook Hong Chao, who is absolutely brilliant as Charlie's caregiver. She's wonderful and has some of the more powerful and emotional moments in the film for me. Loved watching her. Four stars for The Whale. Then it's another case of the automatic whiplash. We went to Bros, which is a rom-com from Billy Eichner. And it was such a delight. It was so good. I just, it was exactly what I wanted and exactly what I needed from a rom-com like this. I actually am skeptical of people that don't love rom-coms, you know. I'm just don't, I'm not sure why those people think that. Madness. This was such a delight. I live for good rom-coms and this was a great rom-com. Now I know that like Billy Eichner's humor can be quite great for some people. Suppose he's got quite a Marmite kind of personality. I love him. So like maybe it's no surprise that I really connected with what he was doing here and with the comedy of this film. Four stars for bros. Then we watch My Policeman, which is the new Harry Styles fronted film, um, which is a review in and of itself, I suppose. Listen, this film isn't particularly good, very bland, doesn't really do a whole much good, and Harry Styles shouldn't be leading films ever again. We, can we park it? Can we, are we done with that? Two stars for My Policeman. Sorry if that felt brief. I just can't be asked. <laughs> then I watched Empire of Light, the new Sam Mendes film. Uh, and I'm, I feel bad. I feel like I'm quickly realizing that Sam Mendes may have passed his peak as a director. I've loved his classics and I have not loved his recents. And this was again, a miss. It feels a lot like a first draft, right, that because he's Sam Mendes, it was allowed to make. Uh, and, you know, you get enough talented people behind the camera. You get people like Roger Deakins to shoot your film. And people go, yeah, cool, green light. But really, Sam Mendes is saying and doing nothing of merit, really, here. And nothing new. And nothing refreshing or engaging. Two stars for Empire of Light. Then I watched She Is Love, which is the worst film I saw at the film festival. Completely obnoxious. I don't want to... I don't want to talk about it. I'm not going to talk about it on the channel. Avoid this film. Complete shite. One star for She Is Love. Then, you know how I was saying that, like, slashers have become my go-to switch-off film? I, I switched off with another slasher, didn't I? Another one which I hadn't seen before, The Slumber Party Massacre. And my god, this film was so much fun. This is exactly what I want from an 80s slasher. When they ask the delivery guy, what's the damage, through the door, and the killer answers back six. Greatest line in a slasher ever. I howled. Three and a half stars for the Slumber Party Massacre. Then I watched The Menu, which was a surprise film at this year's film festival. But this was a fun time. A good enough time, I think, in that environment with a packed out audience. It played really well to the crowd. I will say that the film festival experience means that a lot of films you just sort of end up forgetting about and end up just thinking a lot less of the further away you get from the film because it just when they don't do enough to stand out they just kind of disappear a bit in your mind and this was kind of one of those three stars for the menu love annie taylor joy uh so maybe that's why i enjoyed it more than i maybe should have then i watched she said which is the time's up drama uh chronicling two journalists as they attempt to bring down or or should i say bring to light the stories of women that have been threatened sexually exploited sexually harassed and assaulted and in cases raped uh, by Harvey Weinstein. A gripping investigative drama that excels in its ensemble cast and earnest desire from Schrader to capture the weight and urgency of individual, collective experience and truth. Just wish its screenplay didn't fall so often to truism. It, it's sort of frustrating in that sense, but definitely on the whole, a, a good solid investigative drama to watch. I think it does illuminate enough to make it feel worthwhile. Three and a half stars for She Said. Then I watched More Than Ever, which is another Vicky Cripps film, but like an entirely different one to Corsage. It's interesting, when you watch film festivals, I love it when 
you watch multiple films from the same actor and you get to see them pop up in all these different visions and perspectives and directing where it's it's weird it's kind of strange but it's fun this one was one which i had no idea about really until i caught it at the festival it's about a woman that decides to go and live on her own as far away as she can from her own life uh, to die essentially and it's every bit as emotional as you can imagine that film is really touching and moving over to the power of personal choice the weight of accepting that what is selfish to some may be the only right decision for you yeah i found that to be a really interesting thread to see approached in film i do think that it's been done thematically before elsewhere and better which sort of gets in this film's way three and a half stars for more than ever we're coming to the end guys we're coming to the end i know this is sort of ending up feeling like a bit of an endurance test <laughs> i, I want to eat my mouth's getting dry oh it's till which is a, a story of emmett till who you don't know is a young boy that was murdered at the hands of uh, racists down in the southern state i can't remember the exact one in america a horrible thing that happened horrible film to have to watch a moving and powerful look at a mother's grief that still feels urgent let down here and there by glossy tone jarring visuals and a few tips into the cliche but honestly i'm not sure a film as angry and desperate in its grief really gives a shit whether it comes off as glossy or cliche yeah i think there's definitely something to be said about the fact that it doesn't really care if you think it's cliche or glossy that it, it, it has a story and it has a perspective that it wants to tell and it wants to explore and it's doing it and i really admire films that do that and and, and have their own way of doing it and just want to go for it three and a half stars for till then i watched glass onion and knives out mystery which was the last film i caught at the film festival and is also again one of my more anticipated films of the year because i adore the first knives out i adore ryan johnson that knives out screening from when that came out back on whatever years london film festival that was was the most fun press screening i think i've ever been to it just was such a hoot it was such a good time it's such a great surprise and this one absolutely lived up to that as well so much fun and such a good way to close the festival out and i absolutely loved it for that i'm gonna leave my full review in the description below so you can see my actual thoughts on that but for now if ryan johnson told me to shit my pants i would do it i would I would shit my pants if Ryan Johnson told me to do it. Four and a half stars for Glass Onion and Knives Out Mystery. And then the last film I saw in October was a Halloween watch. Ooh, spooky. Um, I don't know why I've just done that. It was Barbarian, which I feel like I was very late to uh, after the whole internet was like, this film's crazy, you gotta see it. I think with films like that, there's a tendency to kind of overhype, especially in the horror realm, I think, as well. Because I think, I don't know what it is about horror, but everyone has their own sort of lines about what is and isn't subversive or what is and isn't scary or what is or isn't silly or stupid i guess but i found this one to be hugely fun i had such a riot with this one and again not watching any trailers not knowing anything about it other than the fact that it was about what airbnb or something threatens to derail itself over and over but consistently hooks you back in and is just such a hoot not quite as insanely unexpected and subversive as i think the hype may suggest but very gleefully playing with expectations in a hugely entertaining and satisfying way overall really satisfied with it and i think this is going to become quite a rewatchable film there's just some really great beats and moments in here four stars for barbarian and that is the end of our mammoth catch-up september and october i feel like i gotta scroll back and show you what we went through even though it was a long time and uh, i'm so sorry i had to put you through that <laughs> so many films uh you can look forward to november not being anywhere near as packed as that in fact it's probably gonna be the opposite i am telling you right now it's the 14th of november right now when i'm filming this and i've watched two films but what about you guys what did you catch in october is there anything that stood out in particular to you anything that you want me to check out next month let me know any of that stuff in the comments down below and we'll have a little chat of course listen if you want to follow me on letterboxd you can go do that the link's down there my guy you can go follow and see this stuff happen real time uh, it's not as exciting as that sounds i'm sorry to say it. there's also links to my other socials down there as well my instagram twitter tiktok uh, lots of fun stuff happening over there randomly uh so go and follow me on any of those if you're so fancy and of course if you enjoyed this video and want to see me talk about more shit go ahead and click subscribe hit the bell button so you're not missing any new videos when they do drop i'll see you guys soon for some more thoughts on more films and not long to go until i get to sit and go through the probably five films i end up seeing in november for you guys so that'll be fun one look out for that i'm off to go and drink a lot of water my mouth's so dry there's a lot of who would have thought talking about films for this long would make your mouth dry huh hmm science <laughs> Thank you